Volume Four, Chapter Seven of Celestina. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, BC. Celestina by Charlotte Turner Smith. Volume Four, Chapter Seven. In the meantime, Celestina was alone at Cheltenham, indulging that regret which arose from the certain loss of Willoughby's friendship, and the assurance that she should see him no more. Every day she expected to see in the newspapers, or to hear from Lady Horatia, that he was married, and although she tried to reason herself into a calm acquiescence, with what was unavoidable she never opened a paper or a letter without trembling but her own unhappiness prevented her not from feeling for the unhappiness of her friends the letter she had received from emily cathcart had made a great impression upon her though she knew not how it would be proper to act to answer the views of the writer at length she determined to write to Mrs. Elphinstone, and enclose the letter itself, and this she did a few days after she was settled at Chettingham. Almost every post brought her accounts of the amendment of Montague Thurgood from Lady Horatia, who visited him constantly, and in almost every letter she expressed, either plainly or by implication, her expectations that celestina would attend to the wishes of all her friends and give him her hand immediately on his recovery this repeated importunity from a person to whose wishes and for whose opinion she felt so much deference to be due was infinitely painful to her but how to escape from it she knew not if she quitted lady horatia she had no proper protection no home to receive her and though her little income had hitherto more than sufficed to support her while with such a friend and though she had received about a hundred pounds from cathcart paid her by the direction of willoughby while he was abroad which yet remained almost untouched yet on such a sum and on the interest of fifteen hundred pounds she could not with any degree of prudence adopt the plan on which her imagination had lately dwelt with peculiar pleasure that of setting out alone or with only a female servant and travelling through france she fancied that there she might be enabled though she had yet no clue to guide her to find some traces of her family an invincible inclination which she sometimes took for the inspiration of heaven had been some weeks gaining on her imagination and everything seemed to encourage it but reason and prudence both of which were perhaps decidedly in favour of her accepting the proper establishment offered her by a man who had not only given so many proofs of his sincere and tender affection for her but who was the son of one of her best friends and avowedly recommended to her by another a man to whom she preferred to every other person except willoughby and whom she would have chosen had willoughby never been in question for her it was very certain that he was in question no longer he was in fact dead to her and no probability remained of his ever feeling for her even the regret that the loss of an agreeable acquaintance might have given him but still her heart and her imagination had been so long accustomed to consider him as their first object that she found it impossible for her to transfer to another the same attachment and without being sensible of love she could not promise it 
she desired nothing but to be permitted to live single and be mistress of her time and herself and not to be inopportune to undertake duties which her heart told her she could not consciously fulfill but she foresaw too evidently that while she remained in her present situation and lady horotia continued so eager for the match her life must pass in a continual conflict between her wish to gratify her friend and her disclination to marriage at her time of life professions of a resolution to remain single were merely laughed at and never believed and montagu thurgood had never hitherto considered her gentle refusals and friendly admonitions to desist but as being in reality as much encouragement as she could give him while her situation in regard to willoughby remained sacredly undecided and while he might renounce the name of lover he might still assume that of a near relation and have the power of controlling or at least of directing her now that it was decided beyond a doubt that he neither meant to avail himself of either the one or the other she saw that she had nothing to urge in support of her refusal which would be listened to and while her mind dwelt on the friendly but still irksome controversy in which she must of necessity be engaged when lady horotia and thoroughgood came down it of course adverted to the means of relief which could she thought be obtained only by her quitting england and for her doing so her natural desire to discover her parents was she thought a sufficient excuse in her present solitude she found so much to soothe and console her that she longed for nothing so much as the power of enjoying it and at the same time wandering through various countries and particularly through that which she had been taught to consider as her own the longer she thought of this plan the more agreeable it became in her imagination and she passed many hours every day in reading travels through france italy and switzerland still humouring this visionary idea till it had acquired the force of a presentment a persuasion that she should go to the south of france she should find her family of this she continually thought of this she continually dreamed and thought one great motive that would have urged her to attempt it the possibility of being restored to willoughby was at an end she still determined to execute this plan before the summer elapsed she had indeed nothing but her gratitude and attachment to lady horotia to detain her in england she could not go to jessie because it was so near elvenstone nor enjoy the friendly and instructive conversation of mr thoroughgood because of the unfortunate partiality of his son the sole remaining friend of her childhood lady molyneux was not merely estranged from her but had invariably treated her with negligence scorn and contempt to england therefore she had at least no friends who attached her the whole world was her country and with that restlessness to which the unhappy are subject she fancied that in any part of it she should find more satisfaction than in her present situation by her wandering continually alone in the pleasant country that surrounded the town where she resided at a season too when the face of nature was every day growing more lovely her talent for poetry which sometimes remained for whole months unexercised was again called forth but whatever were the objects really before her whatever were presented to her mind by books willoughby was ever the principal figure in the landscape if she sat on the green hill as she often did for hours together 
lost in mournful yet unpleasing reverie it was only to recollect scenes that were past with the same sounds she had then heard the simple sheep bell the early songs of birds the same sense of fresh turf and wild flowers brought again more forcibly to her recollection if in her reading she was by the traveller's lively description of the countries he had passed through to fancy herself there she reverted instantly to the delight she should have felt could she in a progress through such romantic scenes have been the companion of willoughby and it was in this disposition of mind that after perusing an account of a cottage and its inhabitants overwhelmed by the fall of an avalanche a great body of snow from the mountain above she composed the following little lyric poem the peasant of the alps where cliffs arise by winter crowned and through dark groves of pine around down the chasms the snow-fed torrents foam within some hollow sheltered from the storms the peasant of the alps his cottage forms and builds his humble happy home unenvied is the rich domain that far beneath him on the plain waves his white harvests and his olive groves more dear to him his hut with plantain thatched where long his unambitious heart attached finds all he wishes all he loves there dwells the mistress of his heart and love who teaches every art has bid him dress the spot with fondest care when borrowing from the vale its fertile soil he climbs the precipice with patient toil to plant her favorite flowerets there with native shrubs a hardy race there the green myrtle finds a place and roses there the dewy leaves decline while from the crags abrupt and tangled steeps with bloom and fruit the alpine berry peeps and blushing mingles with the vine his garden simple produce stored prepared for him by hands adored is all the little luxury he knows and by the same dear hands are softly spread the chamois velvet spoil that forms the bed where in her arms he finds repose but absent from the calm abode dark thunder gathers round his road while raves the wind the arrowy lightnings flash returning quick the murmuring rocks among his faint heart trembling as he winds along alarmed he listens to the crash of rift ice o man of woe o'er his dear cot a mass of snow by the storm severed from the cliff above has fallen and buried in his marble breast all that for him lost wretch the world possessed his home his happiness his love aghast the heart-struck mourner stands glazed are his eyes convulsed his hands o'erwhelming anguish checks his laboring breath crushed by despair's intolerable weight frantic he seeks the mountain's giddiest height and headlong seeks relief in death a fate too similar is mine but i in lingering pain repine and still my lost felicity deplore cold cold to me is that dear breast become where this poor heart had fondly fixed its home and love and happiness are mine no more when celestina was thus with more tenderness than discretion cherishing the memory of the friend she had lost willoughby was very differently occupied from what her imagination suggested instead of being the gay and fortunate lover on the eve of marrying one of the greatest heiresses in england he was suffering in his personal health from the anxiety of mind at war with itself and certain of nothing but that 
for him the world no longer contained any happiness the intelligence however vague and like the common gossiping stories so usual among servants that he had received from farham had made a great impression which what he afterwards gathered from the same quarter had increased justina had told farham as a secret however of the first importance that captain kavanagh had been of late in the habit of being admitted to her young lady's dressing-room after lady castlenorth and the family were retired however late the hour might be that her young lady was obliged to entrust her with these visits that they might be more securely concealed from the rest of the family but that sometimes she had been dismissed to bed and sometimes ordered to wait till he retired that on some of these occasions she observed her young lady had been crying by the redness of her eyes and that then the captain had always left her with the air of a man much offended that she had sometimes heard them talk in voices as if they were arguing upon something but could never distinctly understand what their conversation was about they were in sad fright always said justina that mealdi heard them mealdi knows not all what goes on in this house and my lady i suppose says farnham would be in a horrible passion if she heard of it oh for me replied she i could not stay if she did find out but why inquired farnham why if your young lady likes the captain so as to have him keep company with her in this manner why does she mean by marrying my master justina then with an arch look answered oh my good friend the captain has one wife already and why should not my young lady have one husband the captain will be her sasebo cavalier servant i don't understand your french out of the way names replied farnham but i am sure that if your lady marries my master only to play such pranks as some other fine ladies do she will get into a bad scrape for he is not a man to be quiet when such fort of doings are going on that i can tell her and if she doesn't love him better than any other man i think she had much better say so oh silly man answered justina as if my young lady could not have a regard for both of them a a replied farnham that may do well enough in your country but it will never do here justina now afraid that farnham's deal for his master would perhaps urge him to reveal the dangerous secret with which she had thus entrusted him began to soften the harshest features of it by saying that she believed there was no harm at all in the friendship between her young lady and captain cavanagh that to be sure the captain was a sweet handsome man and very agreeable and therefore her young lady liked to talk with him which she never could do when her mother was by as she never suffered him to speak hardly to anybody else and that it was natural enough for her lady to like the captain and have a regard for him because she had known him so long she ended her conversation with exacting from farnham a promise that he would never mention a syllable to anybody of what she had told him a promise which he kept however only till he could reveal it all to his master willoughby had after receiving this information no longer a doubt as to breaking off instantly his proposed alliance but how without plunging a dagger in the heart of his uncle to do this required some consideration lord castlenorth had sent him full directions as to paying off the encumbrances upon his estate and deposited the money at a banker's 
where he had also left a large sum for his own use and expecting him to join the family at paris if he did not overtake them sooner and was now pleasing himself with the idea that in a very few days the favorite project of his life would be completed and that in adopting the son of his sister and uniting him with his daughter he should transmit his name and his honors to posterity with little variation from lineal descent it was this hope that seemed to have sustained his feeble existence to his present period in spite of the numerous infirmities he labored under and even of the prescriptions and nursing of mrs calder and though it was impossible for willoughby either to love or esteem such a man as lord castlenorth yet he felt for him some regard as his mother's brother and some pity not only for his real but his imaginary sufferings which he knew must be dreadfully increased and perhaps become fatal from so heavy a disappointment of all his expectations he hesitated then how to act whether to write or go to him or whether he should not rather address himself to lady castlenorth or her daughter and for two days after their departure had been unable to resolve on anything when a porter who immediately disappeared gave to the servant of the house a letter for him it was evidently written in a foreign hand and in a foreign idiom though pains seemed to have been taken to disguise both the contents were these sir one who is and will be always a stranger to you takes a liberty to approach you with this advice so important to you and fearing it may be soon too late you are sir on the point of being married as the report goes to the daughter of lord castlenorth miss fitzhaman your relation i have cause to know that her heart is belonging to another person and only chagrin and inquietude will be the effect if you execute this marriage whatever may have seem to the contrary if there is any doubt of the truth of this a little observation or making inquiry among those near her will explain what i would say and if there is question of the person she has a great friendship for you have only to think of those who are always with her a word they say to the wise is enough for them to understand I have the honor to be, with profound respect, sir, your devoted servant, unknown. Willoughby had no sooner read this letter than it struck him that it was written either by Kavanagh himself or by some person employed by him, and his motive evidently was to prevent a marriage he now saw so nearly concluded and which would destroy all his hopes of securing to himself this opulent heiress rather than her mother whose lavish fondness for him had enabled him by some means or another it was probable they were not very justifiable means to release himself from his former engagements engagements which with far other views she had assisted him to dissolve many concurring circumstances strengthened the persuasion that this letter was fabricated if not written by kavanagh it seemed to be the translation of a letter first written in french and willoughby heard that kavanagh could not write english with facility from a long disuse it was certainly kavanagh's interest by any means to stop the marriage between him and miss fitzhaman which perhaps no means could have done more effectually since from the tears she had frequently been observed by justina to shed in their long conferences it was probable his arguments had failed of their effect if willoughby had before felt something like apathy towards miss fitzhaman 
which he never could wholly conquer, he now found it amounting to abhorrence and detestation. The love she had shewn towards him must either have been the effect of art or of vice, and both were to him equally odious, that she could hope to impose upon him by the one or think him a proper object for the indulgence of the other were ideas equally hateful and equally humiliating and under the first impulse of indignation he was tempted to write her and enclosing the letter from his anonymous correspondent add to it all the circumstances farmham had learned of justina as reasons why he renounced her with contempt but after a little reflection he manly and generous spirit inspired him with far other designs it was possible that his cousin whom he now considered with as much dislike but with more compassion might yet be saved from the artifices of a villain and he thought himself bound to attempt it by every exertion except the sacrifice of himself in marriage it was possible that his uncle, though he could not make that sacrifice to gratify him, might yet be in some degree preserved from the dreadful shock which his daughter's conduct must give him. Were it described to him in the horrid light he himself now saw it in, or revealed to him by any one less cautious than himself, distressing, therefore, as the scenes must be, that he should have to go through when instead of joining the family to complete his marriage he should meet them with those charges which put an end to it for ever he determined to follow them immediately and writing to cathcart such instructions as were most requisite as to the management of his affairs and without hinting how different the purpose of his journey was from what it was supposed to be he departed as soon as his physician dismissed him for the continent which was in something more than a week after the castlenorths had left london everybody concluded that he had gone to his bride and everybody's conjectures remained uncontradicted lady horatia in her letters to celestina told her that lord castlenorth's illness had ob obliged him to quit england on a very short notice willoughby and miss fitzhaman had been privately warned the day before they set out that some business as to his estates detained him afterwards five or six days in london but that he was now gone to the castlenorth family at paris and was to proceed with them to pass the summer in Italy. The same account found its way into the public prints, and was received without any doubt. Celestina shed many tears over the first information she received, and then, accusing herself of folly, tried to dry them, and to detach her mind from thinking of Willoughby. But this no effort enabled her to do, and although all anxiety was now lost in the most painful certainty she sunk from fruitless solicitude into hopeless dejection in such a frame of mind lady horatia found her when after a separation of about three weeks she rejoined her at chatham with her arrived montague thorogood quite recovered of his wound deriving from it and from thus being allowed to attend celestina more hope than ever while his love seemed to have increased if to increase were possible and while his sufferings and his merit certainly rendered him interesting to celestina and combined to entitle him to her friendship her pity and esteem she felt and felt with regret that decided as she believed her fate now to be in regard to willoughby friendship esteem and pity were yet all she could give to montague thoroughgood
End of Volume 4, Chapter 7 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Volume 4, Chapter 8 of Celestina. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Celestina by Charlotte Turner Smith. Volume 4, Chapter 8. Willoughby with every sensation that could render such a journey unpleasant proceeded to paris where he learned that his uncle impatiently waited for him had he gone immediately to him he must have crushed at once all the expectations his appearance raved, and the shock must have been too great and too cruel he determined at first therefore to write to lady castlenorth yet after some reflection doubted whether it would be not better to give the letter he had received to miss fitzhaman and leave it to her to find the means of dismissing him without his being compelled to assign the true reason it was still possible that the charges against her might be unfounded or exaggerated it is possible that were there neither he might rescue her from the abyss to which she seemed to be devoting herself but from the pride and violence of her temper and from the imperious spirit which had nev never yet borne to be told of an error he not only felt great uneasiness from the idea of the scene that was before him but doubted whether the person for whose sake he was willing to encounter it would not baffle all his endeavours to rescue her from evil or conceal her errors by clamour and resentment after some deliberation however as it was necessary to fix on something he wrote a short note to miss fitzhaman desiring she would favour him with a few moments conversation and entreated her for reasons which he would then explain to her not to inform lord or lady castlenorth of his arrival at paris till after he had seen her this note he sent by farnham to justina to be delivered to her mistress and received in a short time an answer that she should be alone that evening at ten o'clock and that Justina should conduct him to her in her own dressing-room. He found her sitting alone, and under the appearance of receiving him with pleasure. There was, he thought, a lurking apprehension of the occasion of this mysterious visit. He felt himself extremely distressed how to open such a conversation, but the consciousness of rectitude and some degree of indignant resentment immediately restored that calmness and resolution which on his first entrance he feared he might fail of commanding he began by apologizing for the liberty he had taken in thus soliciting an interview with her before he saw the other parts of the family but i am persuaded madam continued he advancing towards her with the letter open in his hand that whatever foundation there may be before the assertion which this letter contains it will be less uneasy to you to read it yourself than to have any appeal made on it to lord and lady castlenorth she took the letter with an air of mingled astonishment and indignation but willoughby saw it tremble in her hand a letter sir in which mention is made of me i am really quite at loss to know what there can be in it that i should in your opinion wish to have it concealed it is not long madame said willoughby fixing his eyes on her face and if you will have the goodness to read it oh certainly sir she ran her eyes over it as he attentively watched her countenance he saw pride struggling to conquer fear and shame 
and with some degree of success for having read it she paused a moment and then assuming an air of haughty resentment she threw the letter on the table that was between her and willoughby and said contemptuously i know not whether most to despise the author of such a letter or the man who if indeed he is not included in both descriptions can poorly make it a pretence for insulting a person who has already been too much for his victim pardon me madame said willoughby for interrupting you but i must take leave to say that i am included in neither a moment's reflection will convince you that i am incapable of the latter and that the former being my object i should not have chosen this method of shrewing this extraordinary billet to you nor thus put it in your power to detect the author without any hazard to yourself of having his charges believed miss fitzhaman i will be very ingenious with you the person here alluded to is captain kavanagh i know it i know that the partiality whether real or affected with which you have appeared to favor me has been superseded by his more eminent merit and though i am very willing to relinquish all prospect of an honor of which i am unworthy i cannot feel much satisfaction in reflecting on the idea you seem to have entertained of my faculty or blindness nor indeed can i without regret see you likely to say rather sir interrupted miss fitzhaman say rather that you rejoice in having found or made an excuse to break through the promises you have given from which however sir you would have been released without degrading yourself by this poor and unmanly artifice the daughter of lord castlenoth need not surely solicit the hand of any man pride and anger now choked her utterance and willoughby taking advantage of her want of words again seized the opportunity to speak he took her hand which she would have snatched from him but he continued to detain it while in the gentlest accents of friendly remonstrance he said come come my dear cousin if i am not your lover at least i can never be your enemy for heaven's sake be not your own confide in me and believe that i will rather take the blame and inconvenience of our separation on myself than suffer you to incur either with your father you cannot suppose i trust you do not even wish i should proceed farther in forming the alliance that brought me hither knowing what i know and what do you know sir and from whom have you obtained this knowledge from sources which render it impossible that i should be mistaken captain kavanagh he was proceeding but either from the tone in which he spoke or some other circumstance which that at that moment struck her she was suddenly impressed with a fear that he had been calling kavanagh himself to an account who as it happened had not that day dined with them this idea threw her instantly off guard she turned pale and asked in an altered and tremendous tone what he meant by those sources of information willoughby saw immediately what she believed and the truth of the information he had received from justina was evident beyond a doubt her fears for her own reputation or of the anger of her father she could conquer but the moment she apprehended that the life of kavanagh either had been or might be hazarded her fortitude failed her it was now the moment to pursue the truth which willoughby by soothing her while he kept the idea of her lover's danger in view at length with great difficulty obtained by her half indignant half contrite avowal that kavanagh had been a too successful candidate for her heart 
and that her father and her mother's eager wishes, together with some other motives, which Willoughby discerned through the confusion and agitation with which she attempted to palliate or conceal them, had prompted her to affect for him a passion she had not felt since she had been in the habits of listening to Kavanagh. Willoughby looked back with terror to the danger he had escaped, and with infinite pity. Mingled with less gentle emotions, cast his eyes again on his cousin. He found her so deeply entangled by the art of Kavanagh, that to save her from him was no longer in his power, but it was possible perhaps to take upon himself the anger and indignation of Lord and Lady Castlenorth, and give her time to arrange her own plans, by immediately withdrawing in silence, though how any comfortable arrangement could be made for her with a man who was understood to be already married, he knew not, nor how Lady Castlenorth would bear so cruel a blow as the presence thus given to her daughter by a man whom she certainly had intended as successor to her present husband whenever his infirmities should release her when the first tumult of these passions which fear shame and love had excited in the bosom of miss fitzhaman subsided by the kind and considerate arguments of Willoughby, she became able to talk with some degree of calmness on the subject, and he found that from the last renewal of their acquaintance with Captain Cavanagh, this design had been certainly entertained by Lady Castlenorth, but that on his part no other advantage had been taken of her extreme partiality towards him than to obtain by her means, money to enable him to prosecute a divorce from his wife, a young woman whom he had married some years before for the sake of some fortune, and a great deal of beauty which she then possessed. Having in two or three years dissipated the former, he left her to make what advantage she could of the latter, and had never troubled himself about her since till his reception in the family of Lord Castlenorth opened to him prospects of carrying off the rich heiress, and making him desirous of obtaining a dissolution of his marriage, for which his wife's ill conduct, though entirely owing to his desertion of her, gave him a very good pretense. Much of this Willoughby learned from various little circumstances which escaped Miss Fitzhaman in this long conversation, for her representation of him was that at the most amiable and unfortunate of men married early in life to a woman insensible of his merit, and now rendered unhappy by a passion for another object, whom he had long seen on the point of being given to a rival, who saw her with very different eyes. Willoughby could not, without astonishment, observe the blind infatuation of a woman, possessed of rather a good understanding, but he found that the art of Kavanagh, to the success of which his very handsome figure had undoubtedly contributed, had so completely attained the government of Miss Fitzhaman's mind, that she no longer saw but with his eyes, and that while, to prevent any suspicion on the part of her mother, she had been suffered to affect a degree of affection for Willoughby, which had long since ceased, Kavanagh trusted to his reluctance to delay a marriage, which it was easy to see he dreaded, and hoped that the divorce would be obtained before the reluctance would be con conquered. He found, however, that Willoughby suddenly agreed to hasten it, and then it was that, in his conference with her, after the rest of the family were in bed, he urged her to find delays, and to procrastinate, herself, a period, to the arrival of which Willoughby no longer seemed adverse. Her tears, 
and the alarm in which Justina had observed her were the effects of the earnestness and impetuosity with which Kavanagh now pressed the necessity of her doing this, and the alternative he sometimes offered her of declaring to Willoughby himself the footing upon which he was with her. Her father's illness, fortunately for her, intervened, and now Kavanagh was every hour in hopes that he should be set free from his matrimonial engagements, and possess himself of the prize so long the object of his ambition, and the end of all his designs. Miss Fitzhaman and Willoughby now were to discuss the means by which, with the least prejudice to her, their intended union could then be broken off. The lady, though she did not ingeniously own it, had many reasons for accepting, unconditionally, her cousin's generous offer to take the whole burden of their displeasure upon himself. She knew, hot only the extravagant and furious passions which any suspicion of its real cause would excite in her mother, but she was aware of the increasing fondness of her father for his nephew, and apprehended that if he appeared the injured and forsaken person that fondness might urge him to make him amends, by giving him a part of the great sums and estates that were in his own power, and this, rich as she would have been, she had not any disposition to promote. After some debate, then, in which way Willoughby should execute himself, and his rejection, on account of their falsehood, of some method which Miss Fitzhaman proposed, he at length determined to write to Lady Castlenorth, stating simply that he had changed his mind and found it impossible to fulfil his engagements, and leave it to her to break it to Lord as she thought proper, for he imagined any letter from himself might be still a severe shock, unless he could assign better reasons than any it was possible for him to offer. This point being settled, Miss Fitzhaman retired to recover herself from the effects of the scene she had just passed through, and to study her part in those that were to come. Willoughby returned, unseen by all but Justina, to his hotel, where he composed a short note to the purport they had agreed upon, and early the next morning he sent out on horseback for Lyons where whence he intended to proceed, along the coast of the Mediterranean, to the Pyrenees, and to pass some weeks among those mountains which he had never yet seen. The recent and extraordinary events that had befallen him gave his mind sufficient subject for contemplation, during the first part of his journey. It was now very certain that he was for ever released and that by means which left him nothing to reproach himself with, from his engagements with Miss Fitzhaman, and of course from that promise to his mother, in consequence of which those engagements were made, one great objection then to his union with Celestina was then removed, and never did her image more tenderly occupy his thoughts than at this moment. But alas! It was no longer cherished with delight. The mystery that clouded her birth, and which he despaired of ever removing, empoisoned the pleasure with which he would have thought of her, and with yet greater bitterness he adverted to the probability there was that she was now the wife of another. Very certain that he should now never find the happiness of which her loss has deprived him, the lesser evils, evils from which, a few years before, he would have shrunk with dismay, seemed to have lost their effect. It was also impossible for him, without injustice to others and uneasiness through himself, to keep such a place as Elvenstone in the present shattered state of his fortune, 
and resolving to disembarrass himself from the necessity of returning to england for some years he wrote from Lyons to cathcart giving him directions to put the estate to sale and at the same time informed the banker in whose hands lord castlenorth had left money for the discharge of all his encumbrances that he should not avail himself of it but that it must be replaced to his uncle's account having thus loosened almost every tie that connected him with england from which he did not wish even to hear left the information of celestina's marriage should reach him and his utmost hope was to obtain by change of place so much tranquillity of mind as to allow him to feel some satisfaction in the variety of the scenes it offered he journeyed from lyons to avignon and then proceeded along the coast by Baziers and Mirepoix into Roussillon, interested by the grandeur and beauty of these remains of Roman antiquity, which he saw in his way, still more charmed by the sublime views which, in this romantic line of country, everywhere offered themselves to his sight and hearing, and but hearing at a distance the tumults with which a noble struggle for freedom at this time the summer of seventeen eighty nine agitated the capital and many of the great towns of france till among the wild and stupendous scenes which he at length reached even this faint murmur died away in one of the cottages scattered at the foot of mont louis he found a young mountaineer acquainted with all the passes of the pyrenees he was there only for a few days on his way back from perpignan to his home in the valley de Doron, and on willoughby's proposing to him he most willingly undertook to be his guide through the mountains willoughby had left his horses at perigan and his present equipage consisted only of farnham carrying a light portmanteau and a sort of haversack for provisions which he took himself strapped over his shoulders on the morning of his departure from the foot of mont louis he travelled towards the south-east always ascending and was soon in the very heart of the pyrenees in scenes which had hardly ever been traversed but by the shepherds and goatherds and where no vestiges of man were seen but here and there a solitary cabin serving them for shelter during a few weeks of summer built of the rough branches of pine or chestnut covered with turf and lined with moss in these huts which were now some of them inhabited Willoughby found a wild but simple and benevolent people, always ready to supply him with such food as their flocks, among these desert regions afforded to themselves, and in one of them on a temporary bed made of the skins of their sheep, whom accident had destroyed after a deep sigh, which was drawn from him by the memory of Celestina, and with which every day concluded he obtained a few hours of refreshing sleep and with the dawn of the next day pursued his journey towards the summit of the mountain amid these paths that wound among the almost perpendicular points of the cliffs he often sat down surveying with awe and admiration the stupendous works of the divine architect before whose simplest creation the labored productions of the most intelligent of his creatures sink into insignificance huge masses of gray marble or a dark granite frowned above his head whose crevices afforded a scanty subsistence to lichens and moss campion while the desolate bareness of other parts added to that threatening aspect with which they seemed to hang over the wandering traveller and to bid him to fear left even the light steps of the izzard 
the chamois of the pyrenees or the wild goats who now and then appeared suspended amid the craggy fissures should insuate should insuate them from the mountain itself and bury him beneath their thundering ruins dashing down amongst the immense piles of stone the cataracts formed by the melting of the snows and the ice of the glaciers in the bosom of the mountains fell roaring into dark and abyss-like chasms whither the eye feared to follow them yet frequently amidst the wildest ores of these great objects appeared some little green recess shaded by immense pines cedars or mountain ash and the short turf beneath them appeared spangled with the smodilla and fringed pink or blushing with the scented wreaths of the daphne cenorium while through the cracks and hollows of the surrounding wall of rock were filtered small and clear streams that crept away among the tufts of juniper rosemary and the rhododendron of the alps that clothed the less abrupt declivity where uninterrupted by intervening crags the mountain shelving gradually to its base opened a bosom more smiling and fertile though which the collected waters no longer foaming from their fall found their way towards the mediterranean sea their banks feathered with woods of cork trees chestnuts and evergreen oaks while the eye carried beyond them was lost in the wide and luxurious plains of languedoc never did such a spot offer itself to the eyes of willoughby but the figure of celestina was instantly present to his imagination he saw her sitting by him enjoying the beautiful and romantic scenery he heard her in those accents which had long such power to enchant him expatiate on its charms with all that exquisite taste and feeling he knew her possessed of and remembering a charming description given by rousseau in his julie of a spot of this sort among the rocks of malary il sembla qui le lieu desert du être la salle du amants en chapelle au versement de la nature for a moment or two he indulged such a delicious reverie till sudden recollection of the truth cruelly destroyed it celestina was not never could be his never could share with him the simple and sublime delight offered by the superb spectacle of nature with all her great works about her whether he was among the rude mountains that she has raised as a barrier to divide two powerful nations or gratified with the more mild beauties of his native country never could she share in his satisfaction or heighten his enjoyment but her hours and her talents were all destined to make the happiness of montague thurgood and that idea he started up and hardly conscious of the rugged precipices beneath him renewed his wandering researches and sought by activity of body to chase the fearful phantoms of lost happiness that haunted his mind he had now passed three weeks among the pyrenees and had traversed several glaciers and descended on the spanish side and looked over part of caledonia again he took his way to their summits again crossed deep valleys of ice and wandered over regions where winter reigns in all its rigor though under a sky of the deepest blue illuminated by the ardent sun of july a sky so clear that not even a fleeting summer cloud for a moment diversifies its radiance one of the tallest of these stupendous points is la pie de Medi de bagnes 
which seems to be the sovereign of the inferior points around it from its tall head he descended to beignet and there meaning to close his researches he rested some days and then by another route returned towards the country of rossillon from whence he had first begun his journey but when he arrived there he had nothing to do but to form some scheme of farther progress and therefore pleased as he was with the variety and novelty offered him by this long chain of immense mountains he determined to lengthen his stay amongst them his guide who had by this time acquired an affection for him delighted to carry him to every place that he thought might offer either novelty or amusement and he now conversed with the smuggler who conveyed at the extremest peril prohibited articles of commerce between france and spain now joined the solitary hunter of izard or smaller chamois and now shared the most dangerous toils of these who sought to bear the wild boar or the wolf among the deep woods that clothed the sides of the mountains it was an excursion with an hunter of the izard that farnham having been left behind at the cabin of a shepherd where willoughby intended to pass the night and gaston his guide were by an accident separated and he found himself alone on one of the most savage spots of the whole chain above him arose a point covered by eternal snow beyond which a glacier spread its desolate and frozen surface for some miles surrounding every way by sharp and barren rocks one side fed by this magazine of ice and snow a broad and darkening torrent through itself falling with deafening noise into a rocky cauldron so far below that the eye could not fathom it a dark and apparently inaccessible wood of firs was on the other side where no tree or plant could find its abode that was not equally able to endure the severity of those cold winds that passing over these immense magazines of ice carry with them frost and desolation even into the rich vineyards and luxurious pastures of gascony and lunduc and there assume the name of the biz wind willoughby had lingered so long among these mountains that it was now the second week of august the evenings were of course somewhat shortening and the sun was visible only by reflection from the snowy point above him when he found himself lost on a place where he knew not his way to any human habitation or was likely to hear the sound of a human voice little accustomed however to fear of any kind he sat himself down on a piece of broken rock to consider if by any of those remarks which gaston had taught him to make he could find his way before nightfall to rejoin his servant and his guide or to find at least some place of shelter these observations however were impeded by the clouds that seemed to arise from the extensive plains below him and to gather round the base of the mountains these increased every moment and at a length surrounded him like waves so that he no longer distinguished the objects beneath him while immense volumes of white vapour were poured like a sea between him and the neighbouring precipices he heard louder than ever but he no longer saw the torrent that threw itself down within a few yards of him and had apprehension ever been under any circumstances troublesome to him he now might well have feared that lost in this chaos of mist 
he should at least remain all night where he was and perhaps never regain his companions at all life however had so few charms for him at this moment that his indifference for it added to his natural courage when only himself was in question made him perfectly calm and collected though the thick clouds of mist continued to gather and darken round the spot where he was no now compelled to remain for a few moments the sighing of the wind which bore this floating vapour the increased hollow murmurs of the rushing waters of the cataract were interrupted only by the screaming vulture and the deep hoarse raven who seemed by their cries as they failed above the great abyss of the mist to be warning of their companions of some approaching danger thunder was in fact gathered in the bosom of these clouds and willoughby as he sat on his solitary rock heard it muttering at his feet and after some tremendous bursts which seemed to shake the mountains to their foundations accompanied by blue and vivid lightning a violent wind rose and dispersing the foggy clouds drove them with the storm generated in their bosom to the country beneath the last rays of the departed sun were now reflected from the summits of snow the air became perfectly serene and willoughby saw distinctly every object around him he observed at some distance to the left a cross in an elevated situation but far below the extremest point of the cliffs and he recollected that the day before gaston had shrewd him that cross and had told him that near to it was the residence of a shepherd and that not far from it a convent near the foot of the mountain towards this therefore he now endeavoured to find his way and by the help of a stick with an iron fixed at the end of it and by his own activity he at length passed difficulties that to many people would have seemed insurmountable and attended only by a terrier which had followed him from england and which had been the faithful companion of all his wanderings he reached the pointed rock where the cross was erected it was now however so late that he began to despair of finding the hut where gaston had told him was situated something lower down the moon indeed was rising in majestic beauty behind him but her light he feared would hardly be sufficient to guide him among the woods and crags with which he was surrounded to an object perhaps entirely concealed within them and with which he was wholly unacquainted he he sat down however till she could afford him more benefit and to consider what he should do when amidst the silence of the night the sound of a human voice in slow cadence accompanied by some musical instrument was borne on the faint breeze that arose from the low lands he listened it was not the illusion of fancy as he had for a moment supposed and he involuntarily exclaimed oh it came o'er mine ear like the sweet south that breathes upon a bank of violence stealing and giving odour his dog too gave evident signs of hearing something unusual ran from his master to the brink of the precipice then returned jumping towards him and seemed rejoiced that they were once more within reach of a human habitation his sagacity assisted his master to follow the sound and descending the mountain by an entangled and almost overgrown sheep path that led from one pointed rock to another he at length entered one of those woods of larch pine and chestnut that fill many of the hollow bosoms of the pyrenes and though the trees rendered it entirely dark the music 
which still continued at short intervals to float in the air led him on till in a small glade overshadowed by rocks clothed with bushwood he saw a small cabin or rather cottage where he had no doubt of finding an asylum for the night his terrier now ran gaily before him and was presently saluted by the loud barking of those dogs which guard the pyrene flocks but on meeting the animals courteously saluted each other and the shepherd's dog seemed glad to shrew the strangers to his master the moon though not yet risen above the trees which on every side shaded the rocks surrounding the solitary glen yet afforded general light enough for willoughby to perceive a group of peasants assembled round the door of the cottage superior in size to any of the cabins of the shepherds which he had yet visited as he approached the founds which had guided him towards it ceased and a man advanced to meet him whose air and manner was very different from the native mountaineers whom he had been accustomed to see though his dress was nearly the same willoughby accosted him in french told him he was a stranger who had lost his guide and desired to be permitted to remain in his cottage till morning enabled him to find his companions the man to whom he spoke hardly allowed him to finish his sentence before in language unalterated with the patios which he had spoken in that country and in a coarse mixture of spanish and french he expressed the utmost solicitude for his accommodation and leading him to the door of the cottage presented him to his wife to an old man her father and to several young people whom his music had assembled round the cabin and who the inhabitants of a little group of cottages dispersed at short intervals among the woods on this part of the valley de Luzon. each individual of this simple party was eager to show civility and attention to the stranger Louison, said he who appeared to be the master of the house and who had met willoughby louison go and prepare what our cottage affords to refresh this gentleman who may well have occasion for it after such fatigue as he has gone through willoughby owned he was almost exhausted and in a moment milk bread and such other simple food as they themselves lived upon were before him with the same hospitable simplicity louison went again at her husband's request to prepare him a bed which one of the younger brothers of his host relinquished to him saying he could find lodging that night at a neighboring cottage le laurier which he found was the name of his host then pressed him to retire to his bed but willoughby refreshed by what he had eaten found his curiosity so strongly excited by the manners and language of this man that it became more powerful than fatigue and he could not help expressing a wish to know how a man who possessed such musical talents and whose conversation was certainly not of that of a mountaineer should be found inhabiting a sequestered nook in the bosom of the pyrenees i inhabit it sir replied le laurier because i was born in it but it is true that i have also seen a great deal of other parts of the world and that it is not yet a month since i quitted the capital of france to return hither after a very long absence long indeed said his wife who had now rejoined them alas so long and she sighed deeply that i never expected sir to have seen him again let me hear said willoughby not only what you have to relate of yourself but what is now passing at paris which you say you have so lately left i have been so long wandering among these mountains that i am wholly ignorant of the consequences of that fermentation which was evident among there among all ranks of men when i passed through it and i was in the midst of it all sir 
replied the laurier for my master chevalier de belgrade was among the prisoners who were released from the castle of mont saint michel but our history is too long for this evening he gave however a brief detail to willoughby of what had passed at paris the preceding july and then gaily turning the conversation said well sir but here i am after all this returned to my cottage in the pyrenees and here is louison and my family we are all happy together and what is yet better my dear master is restored to his home here below us and where is his home oh sir the chateau of rochemart where his family has lived since the beginning of the world i believe it is just down the valley have you seen it to-morrow please heaven you shall and you shall see my master who is now indeed the count of belgarde for his father and brother are dead you shall see him sir and how a man enjoys liberty that has been a prisoner so many years not indeed for that he is so happy as some people would be because of the misfortunes in the beginning of his life which always hang upon his mind but now i hope in time he will get over them for my part i think it folly to lament what we cannot help or regret what cannot be recalled i wish the chevalier was of my disposition tis a very fortunate one at least for yourself replied willoughby and has undoubtedly helped you gaily through the world no sir not gaily but tolerably amidst the severest of those misfortunes which i shared with the chevalier i had always a persuasion that i should revisit my cottage and my louison ah thank heaven your persuasion was just one my friend replied his wife and now we may not part with the melancholy impressions on our minds let us have a little more music the laurier then began to play on the instrument willoughby had before heard and which was something between a lute and a spanish guitar he touched it with uncommon taste and sang a simple rustic air the cadence was solemn and pathetic but at every close the female part of his auditory joined their voices in unison willoughby had now time to observe the groups before him by the clear light of the moon which cast a mild and unclouded radiance around them the scene was simple and affecting le laurier a fine manly figure sat on a feet of turf by the side of his door his wife a very handsome woman stood leaning against the side of it her head inclined towards him a girl twelve or thirteen years old who was his eldest daughter leaned on the turf and looked up towards him with a fort of innocent and affectionate admiration while a boy of seven the youngest of his children had fallen asleep as he sat at her feet and rested his head on her lap two or three young peasants were behind listening to the music and gazing at the stranger and in a chair before the door the venerable father of the family sat contemplating the felicity so lately restored to them all by the return of le laurier with the mild resignation of reposing age a thousand fragrant smells floated in the air after the rain and the lightest wind whispered among the woods by which they were every way surrounded not a sound interrupted the plaintive pastoral air which the performer now began to play while his wife and daughter alternately sung a stanza it was kind of romance in paltoy but willoughby understood it to be the complaint of a mountain shepherd whose mistress had forsaken him for a richer establishment there was nothing new in it but it was the language of nature and brought forcibly to the mind of willoughby his misfortunes the soothing melancholy which 
every object around him seemed to breathe the light of the moon trembling amongst the waving branches of which celestina had so often remarked the effect when they were wandering together the simple cadence of rustic music even the happiness which he saw on the countenances of his host and his family combined to rise in his mind and regret and languor never could he now hope to enjoy such a scene with celestina never was he likely to taste the delight of being restored to all he loved oh no celestina was the wife of another and the world had no happiness for him as he indulged these melancholy thoughts he sat almost motionless and appeared to be attending to the music of the laurier but on a sudden they quite overcame him and striking his hands together he started up and walked suddenly away from the little assembly his host immediately ceased to play and following him inquired with unaffected solicitude if he was ill willoughby immediately recovering himself thanked him for his kindness and assured him that his emotion was occasioned merely by the song he had heard which had brought some unpleasing recollections to his mind the man instead of attempting to console him by commonplace speeches said he would then leave him a moment and hoped he would soon rejoin them and allow them to wish him a good night willoughby walked on a little farther toward the wood he looked up at the moon even at this moment he said perhaps the eyes of celestina are fixed on thee mild and beautiful planet those fine and expressive eyes which have seen fill with tears of admiration and delight as they have contemplated the beauty of the universe and the wisdom of its creator ah celestina our hearts were made for each other but yours yours is perhaps changed and to me is lost as well as your person he dared not trust himself with the train of thought but turning walked slowly back towards the cottage door where only le laurier and his loraison now waited to shrew him to bed as he walked silently along the bells of a convent below seemed to be calling its inhabitants to their evening prayers and from a higher part of the mountain which arose very suddenly beyond the woods a small bell answered and was re-echoed among the rocks on his reaching the laurier he inquired what these sounds meant the bells below said he are those of the convent of st benoit about half a mile below us and the smaller one is that of father anthony a hermit who inhabits one of the rocks above he has lived there many years and where is the castle of rock mark inquired willoughby it is almost close to the convent replied le laurier and if you wish to see them both i will wait upon you thither to-morrow willoughby now repeated his acknowledgments for the courtesy he had received and retired to his rustic bed where fatigue in despite of the depression of spirits was his last reverie brought upon him gave him up to repose and he for a while enjoyed that sweet forgetfulness of human care without which the wretched would lose the power of enduring their wretchedness and the happy that of enjoying their good fortune end of volume four chapter eight recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c volume four chapter nine of celestina this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Celestina by Charlotte Turner Smith. Volume 4, Chapter 9. By the break of day, the following morning, Willoughby had left his rustic couch 
and joining his host and his family partook of their simple meal he felt some concern on reflecting on the panic poor farnham must have been in when the guide returned without him to the place of rendezvous the preceding evening he expressed his uneasiness on this head to la laurier who said he knew the place described perfectly and would immediately send thither the son of a neighboring shepherd who was then employed about his cottage and bring his servant and the guide to him in the meantime he proposed to shrew willoughby the chateau of his master a proposal which his guest readily accepted louison however on their being about to depart had in her very expressive face a look of concern and in her manner an appearance of inquietude for which willoughby wished to account he was not long in left in suspense she took her husband's hand and said my friend you will not leave me long no simpleton replied he and then turning to willoughby he gaily exclaimed here is a woman who is afraid of trusting her husband to go half a mile ah oh, monsieur said lauzon you would not blame me if you knew how he once left me he went away only for a few days and he stayed nearly three years but not voluntarily indeed answered la laurier i met my master my dear master who had been so kind to me in prison in distress in a state of mind bordering on insanity and i could not leave him i do not blame you for that my friend said louison but i own i am afraid of its happening again how happen again the chevalier or rather the count my master is not now as he was then ah no but you have owned yourself that he is restless and unhappy and though he appears at times delighted with being restored to his liberty his estate and his daughter yet at times his mind is unsettled and his schemes wild and uncertain and if he sh should take it into his head to travel again you fear that i may be tempted to travel with him yes said his wife indeed i do le laurier then tried to laugh away her apprehensions and they left her while willoughby felt his dialogue give new force to the curiosity he had to see the count de bellegarde as their way was down through the woody side of the mountain they soon reached the domain of the chateau in which the first object that struck willoughby in a spot which once had been cleared of trees but where the underwood and a smaller growth of wood again almost concealed it was a pavilion which had once been magnificent but was now in ruins it was built of various colored marbles found in the pyrenees was of grecian architecture and seemed to have been a work of taste the pillars of the portico though broken yet supported its roof and behind it were three apartments that had once been richly furnished one as a banqueting room the other two as rooms for the siesta which is usually taken here in as in spain the canopies of yellow damask were fallen and the hangings of the rooms devoured by the moths and decayed by the damps from the windows which having never been glazed the shutters had long since dropped down there was something particularly melancholy to the mind of willoughby in contemplating this building once the seat of gaiety splendor and luxurious repose thus deserted and he inquired of le laurier if the present count never intended to repair it sir replied he my lord the count has hardly the time to think about that yet 
for he has been so little a while at his castle that everything there remains as it was ruinous enough but as for this pavilion i question if ever it will be put in order though my lord has such an odd sort of liking to it that the moment almost he got home he came down to look at it it was quite late in the evening but it was not dark and he looked in at the window for that night i could not open the door the key was lost and the locks were all rusty and by what he said i am sure there is some story belongs to this place the people of the castle indeed always had a notion of its being haunted ever since the death of my lord's sister whose heart they say was broke by her father's ill usage certain it is that the old count caused this place to be shut up and took away the fine glasses and pictures that were in it once but what you fee now he left to fall to pieces there used to be large trees all around it and all manner of flowers and the stream that now almost stagnates among these reeds and rushes and with difficulty finds its way to the moat of the castle was then brought into a bath behind the banqueting house and into a basin which is now grown over with weeds and grass so it can hardly be traced willoughby left this desolate spot with a sigh as his companion led him through the obscure paths of the woods that surrounded it he inquired whether the castle itself had equally suffered from time oh yes sir replied le laurier from time and from war too it was formerly a place of great strength and of great importance as a pass into france from the spanish side of the pyrenees and held out a long siege when the famous count of bellegarde my lord's ancestor defended it for henry the fourth our king against the army of the league perhaps said willoughby your lord may not like the intrusion of a stranger into his retirement oh replied his conductor we may not happen to meet him or if we should it will be a sufficient introduction and recommendation for you sir that you are an englishman for he loves the english encouraged by this assurance willoughby proceeded and in a few moments the woods ascending a little as they reached the extreme base of the mountain opened into what could only be called a plain where opposed to the surrounding hills for the ground was rugged and uneven scattered with masses of ruined buildings that had formerly been part of the outward fortifications but of which some were fallen into the fosse and others overgrown with alder ash and arbeal the gate of the castle and all beyond the moat however was yet entire as were the walls within the circumference bearing everywhere the marks of great antiquity but of such ponderous strength as time alone had not been able to destroy where breaches had been made by cannon the walls had been repaired but this work being of less durability than the original structure had gone to decay and the depredations of war were still very visible the whole was composed of grey stone the towers at each end rose in frowning grandeur above the rest of the building and having only loops and no windows impressed ideas of darkness and imprisonment while the moss and wallflowers filled the interstices of the broken stones and an infinite number of birds made their nests among the shattered cornices and half-fallen battlements, filling the air with their shrill cries 
over the moat which was broad and deep but now only half full of water which was almost hidden by aquatic plants sheltering several sorts of water fowls that now lived there unmolested a drawbridge with massive chains led to the gate of the first court under a high arc gateway defended by a double portcullis this court was where the castle guard were used to parade it was spacious and the buildings that surrounded it were gloomily magnificent but now no warlike footsteps wore away the grass which grew over the pavement no martial music echoed among the arches and colonnades one solitary figure alone appeared slowly walking with his arms crossed on the terrace that led to the second court there is my lord the count said le laurier speak to him then replied willoughby and apologize for my intrusion le laurier advanced with his hat in his hand and at the same moment the count who then first perceived him and willoughby came towards them his military air and dignified figure were tempered by the mild and courteous manner with which he moved forward to receive the stranger whom le laurier announced to him he was greatly above the common height thin and a little bent as if from depression of spirit but his face pale sallow and emaciated as it was was marked with such peculiar expression that all the adventures of his life seemed to have been written there when he spoke his dark eyes were full of fire and vivacity yet at times they were wild and at others heavy and glazed his brows were a little contracted and hollowness about his temples and cheeks and the strong muscular lines of his whole face seemed to bear the harsh impressions of the hand of adversity rather than of time for though his hair was gray and he looked much older than he really was willoughby did not think of him above four or five and forty at his breast was the cross of the order of saint esprit and his dress that of a captain of cavalry was not modern and apparently neglected his whole appearance instantly announced him to be a man of high rank if willoughby was pleased with his manner and address he seemed equally or even more gratified by the curiosity expressed by an englishman to visit him you see me here sir said he released only a few weeks ago from a long imprisonment wondering at my freedom and a stranger in my own house to those only who have been the victims of despotism it would be easy to comprehend my sensations on such a sudden emancipation and the triumph with which i reflect that i owe it to the same noble efforts which have given liberty to france to my country ah continued he pausing and losing at once all the vivacity with which he had a moment before spoken ah what sensations of concern are mingled with this exultation i regain my freedom but where shall i regain my happiness he now fell into a deep musing which lasted only a moment while willoughby walked by his side on the terrace then suddenly awakened from it he cried but it is too soon to trouble you with this sort of conversation we shall have time enough for i flatter myself sir with a hope of your staying with me as long as you remain in this country you must have no other home if you know the pleasure i have in conversing with the english he paused again as if forgetting what he meant to say and then added i will introduce you to my daughter to my little anzoletta for i have saved her that one little gem is restored to me in all its lustre amid the wreck of everything else that was dear to me we will find her now 
he then entered through another arched way the second court of the castle and willoughby accompanied him in silence while le laurier with his hat in his hand followed as the count bade him they entered an immense hall barbarously magnificent it was roofed with beams of oak and the sides covered with standards and trophies of armour the perishable parts of which, which were dropping to pieces the narrow gothic windows were filled not with glass that emitted the light but with glass painted with the achievements of the family mingled with the heads of saints and martyrs whose names were now nowhere to be found but in the archives of the neighbouring convent but in contemplating the innumerable coats of arms that were blazoned on the windows and on the banner that hung in faded majesty between them willoughby could not help recollecting what food they would afford for the favourite speculations of his uncle and his thoughts dwelt a moment on the scene that might have passed in consequence of his absence in the family of castlenorth these reflections however he had neither inclination nor time to indulge for the count ascending a broad but steep staircase of stone that led out of the hall and wound within one of the turrets entered a gallery and at the end of it was his daughter's apartment the door of which was open and willoughby was immediately introduced to a young person who sat before a frame working on a piece of embroidery a woman between fifty and sixty who seemed to be a kind of governess was with her willoughby was pleased by the graceful simplicity of her figure and the beauty of her face but when she spoke in answer to the compliment he made her this pleasure was converted into amazement he fancied he heard the voice of celestina so striking did its tones resemble those to which his heart had been always trembling responsive that had he not seen who spoke he should not have doubled doubted it of being celestina herself he stared started and felt the blood rush into his cheeks nor could he immediately recollect himself enough to repay to what anzoletta said and again called forth those sounds to which the second time she spoke he listened with increased astonishment and more painful delight for not only the similarity of the voice not only the similarity of her voice to that of celestina was more evident but he saw a resemblance to her in the air and manner of anzoletta that assisted the delusion anzoletta seemed to be about the age of celestina but her figure was less her hair and eyes much darker nor had she that dazzling and radiant complexion which made it always difficult to believe of celestina that she was a native of the south of europe the features of anzoletta were perhaps more regular and were not turned like celestina so that the resemblance consisted in that sort air of family consisted in that sort of air of family which we sometimes observe among relations a kind of flying lightness which we now detect and now lose the count seemed highly gratified by the notice of willoughby took of his daughter to whom he now spoke and bade her prepare herself for dinner for that his guest would was to remain with them he then led willoughby back to the room where he usually sat himself and as they went he said is not my anzoletta charming she is indeed replied willoughby perhaps added the count perhaps you would not believe that she is the child of the daughter of a man of inferior rank one of my father's vassals is she not your daughter my lord inquired willoughby yes replied the count she is my legitimate daughter and as such i glory to acknowledge her but her mother was rolaurier and 
to my marrying her she owed all her misfortunes and i many of mine but if you ever think it worth while to hear the incidents of a life that has i think been marked with some similar occurrences i shall have a melancholy pleasure in relating them nothing would oblige me so much said willoughby whose curiosity had been every instant increasing especially since he had seen anseletta may i till i can be so gratified inquired where is the mother of your lovely daughter yes replied the count and you will hear a fresh instance of the barbarous policy which despotism encourages and protects her mother she was compelled by my father the last count of belgrade to enter into a convent of carmelites at bayonne and there to take the vows she was my wife by the law of god and man but i was absent with my regiment i was unable to protect her and the power of the governor of the province and of an enraged and tyrannic father were united to tear her from me would to heaven we have been the only victims but there was yet another another who is gone whence there is no return here he fell into one of those fits of silent musing to which willoughby had even during their short acquaintance observed him to be subject it lasted however only a moment and then recovering from it he clasped his hands eagerly together and cried with energy but for my wife my jacquelina thanks to the generous glorious spirit of my country i shall retrieve her she yet lives i have seen her through the iron bars of her cloister i have spoke to her i have in my bosom a handkerchief which she gave me bathed in her tears she told me where to find our child our little anzoletta and i go to paris to demand and obtain her liberty to claim her as my wife and to be enabled to bring her hither to a husband who changed as she is by consignment and affection she still adores her to her daughter whose early excellence promises to reward us both for many many years of separation and sorrow the eyes of the count were filled with tears as he ceased speaking and willoughby whose heart was as tender as it was manly was deeply affected heaven grant you all your wishes sir cried he and that your private happiness may be one of the innumerable blessings attending on public felicity the count wrung his hands and cried with yet increased vivacity it will it will my friend there was in his manner a something bordering on wildness as he continued this discourse which willoughby remarked with some concern he was not therefore sorry when it was interrupted by the entrance of la Laurier, who told him that the messenger he had dispatched had found his servant and the guide and relieving them from their fears for his safety which had been cruelly severe upon poor farnham had brought them both to the castle whither his wife had directed them willoughby had been under a good deal of concern for farnham who he knew must have been dreadfully alarmed for the safety of his master his arrival therefore was particularly welcome and he was glad to change his clothes for which purpose he now begged leave to retire the court ordered the laurier to shrew them to an apartment and to take care he had every accommodation he desired willoughby as he marched gravely along through the long galleries and across the gloomy hall fancied himself a knight of romance and that some of the stories of enchanted castles and wandering adventures of which he had been so fond in his early youth 
were here realized. End of Volume 4, Chapter 9 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C.